Okay, good afternoon, everyone. This is the Vermont House Committee on Commerce and Economic Development, along with the uh, House Committee on Healthcare. Um, this is a joint hearing um, for, uh, to hear uh, Healthcare Workforce Strategic Plan Report. So first up, uh, uh, State Auditor Doug Hoffer, and just to let everybody know, this is uh, Friday afternoon. So this is Friday, January 26, 2024 at 1.08 in the afternoon. So with that, uh, Madam Chair, did you want to? No, I appreciate us doing this together. I think we both committees have put a lot in place over the last couple of years. And so it's going to be great to see where it's landed and what else we might need to do. Thank you. So, Mr. Auditor, thank you for joining us this afternoon. You're muted. Doug, can you hear us? Is that better? Yep, there you go. Okay, sorry about that. I'll get the visual up too. Thank you for having me today. Is that good? Nope. No visual? No, nope. nope. get your voice. I don't use Zoom very often. We use um, Teams. There you go. There you go. All right. I'm in your neighborhood. Not really. <laughs> I apologize for being remote, but our building is still shut down. So thank you. Not a problem. So as you know, uh, we did this work because like you, we, we think it's an important issue. Obviously the community at large needs more nurses for a lot of reasons. And uh, we wanted to see if the programs were working, the incentive program. So uh, the question is, how do you define success? In this case, presumably it's you know, what are we getting for the investment? Uh, how many new nurses are they sticking around and for how long? Unfortunately, uh, we can't answer the question. We need data to answer the question. And one of the key things we found in looking at the various programs that you have created, uh, there really are no performance or evaluation tools yet, which makes it impossible for us to do the work. Uh, but we did come away with some not findings, but some information we can share with you. And you probably read the report. It's not terribly long. Uh, you know, the, the incentives, as far as we could tell, are not coordinated. And that's not a big problem for the state, I don't think. But we did learn that there are incentive programs at a number of the hospitals. And I'm not sure that the state programs or the state funded programs really include consideration of those private uh, efforts and how they work together or not. So that's one thing to think about. Uh, the other is that, you know, this is a great time to do this, as JFO also pointed out. There's a lot of money still on the table. And therefore, you can make some changes that, that could have an effect pretty quickly and uh, influence, you know, the rest of the money that's currently available, let alone new, new funds that you allocate. Um, and arguably, at least as importantly as, you know, the hospitals have made some progress in reducing their reliance on traveling nurses but it is a massive cost and drain on the system. I was shocked to learn that in the last three years, the hospitals have spent $357 million on traveling nurses. Uh, so every dollar spent to reduce that amount has a direct benefit on the cost of healthcare. Doug, uh, was that, Doug is that all, is that just hospitals or is that all healthcare? Just hospitals as far as we know. Yeah, so we know that there's nursing homes and home health agencies that are having the same issue. Right. The information we got came from the Green Mountain Care Board, as a, I think, as a part of the hospital budget process. So that's why it's limited to hospitals. Okay. Um, we, unlike JFO, we focused exclusively on nurses. I know their charge was broader and included other healthcare professionals. So that's helpful to have that extra data. Uh, so as I said, we did not conduct a full-blown GAGAS audit because we just didn't have sufficient performance data to answer the questions. Uh, and if we don't do something about getting performance measures and evaluative tools, we'll never be able to do an audit report. I mean, we could wait a, a year because the programs are so new, that's another issue. But if we don't have data, we can't answer the questions and, and neither can you. Uh, 
although we have a number of recommendations on the last page of our report, there was one that I see in the uh, JFO uh, brief that's really encouraging and that it echoes ours and it's from AHEC and I'll read it. I'm sure you guys have read it, but I'll read it out loud. It's so good. Uh, consider uh, adding statutory language across workforce development incentive programs that requires the administering entities to establish consistent, agreed upon benchmarks, common definitions, annual price measures, process measures, and longitudinal outcome measures. Without consistent measures, methodologies, and common reporting structures, it is challenging to determine program effectiveness uh, relative to the investment and relative to other workforce incentive programs. Uh, here, here, that's, that's exactly what's needed. The only thing I would change is the very first word says, consider. I would say, just do it. The sooner the better. Uh, not an easy task, but this, it's still January, thank goodness. Uh, we had a couple of other things that I think were not addressed by JFO that, that you may have seen in our report. And in addition to aligning all the programs uh, in terms of uh, having comparable service year obligations by those who benefit from the program, uh, I think you should seriously consider uh, increasing the service obligation. And here's something to think about and, and why I think it's so obvious to me. The median hourly wage for an RN is $9 an hour higher than an LPN. So in one year, if a person goes through the process, the additional education and the certification comes out an RN, in the very first year, they're gonna make an additional $17,000 on average once they hit the median. So if you extend that over the life and career of that person, it is an enormous, career-changing, life-changing decision, and good for them, and we need them. It's all good, it's a win-win for everybody. But I'm not sure that it's a fair match between what we ask of them in return, since it's a career-long benefit. We're asking for one year of service for one year of the incentive, and I, I would encourage you to reconsider that. Uh, the other is that we learned uh, that there are, you may know this, uh, that there are some nurses who live in Vermont, but are licensed and work in a neighboring state for any number of reasons, uh, probably money is a big part of it, but they represent um, a possible pool. And there's hundreds of them, possible pool of people who could be uh, encouraged one way or another to return to Vermont. And they're already certified to return to Vermont. So, you know, as you consider working with the, the parties, the administrative entities on how to collect more data, not just as they're in the program, but longitudinally, I would also consider reaching out to these nurses that are currently working in neighboring states and, and see what, if anything, could bring them back, because they're a great resource, no doubt. So that's really all I had for now. Any questions for Doug? Um, thank you. And thank you for your information, your report. It's fantastic. Um, I'm just you know, you mentioned considering um, the obligation a little bit longer. I, I specifically remember when we were trying to come up with the length of obligation, years served, <coughs> we were competing with other states who are also scrambling to incentivize nursing programs. And we were trying to align the obligation length to them. Um, I'm wondering if if you looked at any of our neighboring states in particular, because we do have a lot of residents that work, say, in New Hampshire or New York. I'm wondering if you looked at any of their programs that they've put into in place to incentivize this career and what their obligation length of obligation was. We did look at some surrounding states and some of them are two years for one year of incentive. And to okay. me, that makes more sense. Obviously, you know, there are gonna be people who for any number of understandable reasons, when they complete their education, something may happen. There may be a family emergency, they've gotta to move to take care of someone uh, or a spouse gets a job somewhere that, that they can't turn down. I mean, life is complicated. But for those who don't have those complications, you know, one for one, considering it's, as I said, it's a career changing event worth a great deal of money. And again, I would be happy for everybody who benefits, but we're making an investment. And ultimately the answer is 
where is that sweet spot? We don't know because we have no data. And one of the things I think that AHEC and we pointed out is we would greatly benefit from interviewing everybody who goes through the program in depth. Uh, everybody's different. Everybody has their own family and personal needs. But I think if we did it regularly, we would probably learn a lot that could be helpful to you to help make these kinds of decisions. Because right now we're just guessing. Yeah. You're welcome. <coughs> Other questions for Doug? Um, <clears throat> thank you, Doug. I, I or Auditor Hopper, sorry. Um, Doug is I, fine. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, I was just wondering if you actually had a number, because you mentioned um, Vermonters who are licensed in neighboring states, but you also mentioned in the report about Vermonters who have left but still have a nursing license, I assume, here in Vermont. Do you know a number associated I'd with that? To, I'd have to check with my team. I don't have that okay. in front of me, but I'll be happy to get back to you. Sure. I'm just curious about how big that universe is. Thank you. Well, we might have. <laughs> uh, by the way, for what it's worth, uh, in my work prior to becoming auditor, I, I occasionally would look at median hourly incomes for a range of occupational titles. And it won't surprise you to learn that in nursing, as with almost every other profession, uh, Vermont is on the low end of the wage scale. Mm -hmm. So if you are in your 20s or 30s or any age for that matter, but say you still have education debt, you're trying to build a career, you can make a lot more money going to Boston or New York than staying in Vermont. So you know we have to find ways to make up the difference, not just with money, which is a challenge, but uh, I, I, I wager unintended pun, I guess that a lot of people who leave do it because they can make so much more other places. And I think, I, frankly, I, I wouldn't surprise me if some of mm -hmm. the people uh, who worked here and are certified here originally ended up becoming traveling nurses because they make so much more than full-time equivalent nurses in the hospitals. It's, it's very significant, almost mm -hmm. twice as much annually. Now, having said that, you're not guaranteed full-time work, but at those wages, you can afford to take a little time off. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Auditor Hoffer, I thank you for your report. I found it illuminating as always. I am curious because AHS in so frequently when they outsource so many of the essential services uh, that are uh, preferred to Vermonters, um, they are very insistent on um, innumerable quanti quantifiable performance measures, both quantitative and qualitative, uh, especially when grant agreements are um, hammered out with various nonprofits in the social service sector. Um, does it surprise you that they didn't have these in place, these types of performance measures for their own programmatic efforts? Or did... Well, yes and no. Um... They're young, the programs are young, but yeah. you know, I, I know a lot about economic development. That's an area I spent some time on. And I know that during COVID and just before, there was a rush to get money out the door. So it wasn't uncommon that the agencies might come before you guys and say, give us the money, we'll design the program and tell you what the performance measures are later. That's dangerous to me. In this case, I was interested that AHS didn't have much to say in response to JFO's report. AHEC had a bunch of good recommendations, but not AHS itself. I was a little surprised by that. Um, I don't know why. I We did not interview them directly for our work. Uh, we we're just looking at the records available. But uh, no, I share your uh, little curiosity and confusion about why AHS isn't deeper into this right now. They have a lot to do, no question about it. Sure. Thank you. Hi. Uh, hi, Auditor Hoffer. This is Representative Cordes. I'm speaking as uh, just giving you, you and the group an update on travel nursing. I currently work both in the state of Vermont as a uh, registered nurse and also have, uh, in the last two years, have completed a number of travel contracts in Maine and in Virginia, and um, largely or partly because of action taken on the federal level to reduce the amount of, um, uh, for lack of a better word, graft taken by some of the recruiting agencies in um, pulling in the extra money, uh, the wages for traveling nurses have, has, they have gone down considerably 
So many, um, just another area where nurses are undervalued. Um, so it, it, it depends on the field that you work, if there's an urgent need, or if there's a hospital that um, uh, the union staff are about to go on strike, um, then those wages offered by travel agencies will be higher, but right now it's not necessarily a great option anymore. Well, it's interesting you say that. I I recall hearing recently something about uh, discussion of a, an agreement amongst all the Vermont hospitals that they won't compete with each other for nurses, which on the one hand might sound good. Uh, it wouldn't change the balance of where there are too many or too few, but it'll also mean that those hospitals that pay more uh, or pay less uh, are, are not going to have to... Or, be forced by the market to pay more. I was curious. Have you heard anything about that? So if I can respond to that, I'll just say from the testimony we've had over the last couple of years, this is uh, Lori Houghton, sorry, chair of the House Healthcare Committee. Um, it is a common problem that uh, hospitals, uh, designated agencies, home health, we're all, they're all competing against each other for the workforce. And so there, people are moving if an incentive is better at one versus another. So it, it is a problem we have in the state, and I would assume it's a problem we have in other states as well. And if I can also just comment on something Jonathan, you asked, I just wanna remind everyone at the table, we put many of these programs, if not all of them, into place. And we are responsible for putting metrics in that would measure the success of them. So that if, if we're finding that what we did or didn't put into place, is not giving us what we need to track this, we need to do that and we need to remember that going forward. So I would not put the blame on AHS on that. That's fair, Madam Chair, my apologies. No, that's okay. Uh, one thought on that as you go forward, um, some people undoubtedly might be reluctant to share information about their lives and life choices out a couple of years from the incentive and their certification and their life. Uh, so I, I would encourage you to think about putting something in the grant agreement that requires them to provide at least baseline information that you can also promise not to make public. Obviously, you can just use it for research purposes. Uh, otherwise, they might say, we'd rather not talk to you. And that would be unfortunate. I think this uh, <laughs> shows a, a great need for us to really consider creating a data bank The questions? Doug, thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. We appreciate it. You're very welcome. Thank you for your good work. And uh, I hope these programs continue and, and you get the data you need and that we need to measure their success. Agreed. Thank you. Thank you. Nolan? Ben, do you want to go up to you or Is there another chair down there? Record, Nolan Langwell, Joint Fiscal Office. Jennifer Carvey, so, Legislative Council. I think this might be my first time for commerce. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, it's not the last. Yeah. <laughs> maybe once, maybe 10, 12 years ago. Could be. Could be. I'm a Here we go. Okay, so, um, so I thought I would just briefly just talk about what our role was in this report, and then just quickly just say what it's in there and why we did it the way we did it. Um, and Jen, jump in whenever. Um, as you know, the law, the legislation required us to do an inventory. Um, it required us to do summary funds, and then it required um, us to come up with recommendations and work with the collaborators being AHS, BSAC, and AHEC. So the first two we felt was well within our scope to come up with an inventory, which I think was really useful to myself as well, because throughout the years, people have asked me, I was like, it's all over the place. So I thought mm -hmm. it was very useful. Having the piece about where the money is also well within the scope of what the work we do, but in terms of making recommendations um, of how you should, how the program should be streamlined, we didn't feel that was within our expertise. We're not in the field 
Um, so what we did instead was just put the recommendations and attribute their recommendations to the other collaborators being AHAC and VSAC. So that was the approach that we took. Um, the, all the information about the inventory of the existing programs was provided to us by AHS. So we tried to uh, highlight where, you know, as required, the amount that was appropriated, the source of the fund, whether it was base or one time, and then the, where the money was in terms of as of 6-30-23. And then recognizing there'd be questions about what about after that, we tried to highlight if that money has since been obligated or a program has been created. So any questions you have about the status of where money is or whether it's been obligated or out the door, we will defer you to AHS. Um, and I think there is someone from AHS on the line who will happily write your questions down. <laughs> I don't know if you want to add anything. Um, no, I don't think so. I mean, it's, thank you to AHS and AHEC and VSAC for their um, cooperation and to Nolan for taking the lead on putting the report together. Um, as Nolan said, the recommendations are from uh, primarily from VSAC and AHEC. Um, we do not typically provide recommendations to nonpartisan staff. We just uh, do what you ask us to do as far as getting information for you to be able to make decisions. Um, and I don't know if you want us, wanted us to put the report up or if you're good with people just looking at it on their own devices. We generally have you put it up on so everyone can see it, even people that are on watching us on YouTube. Yeah, if, you, if you don't mind, we'd love to have it up on. All right. That's All right. Yeah, that's right. right. Yeah, we usually do that. Moment too. And I assume it's on today's link so that people. Yes, it is. Claire has sent me that. The other thing I also added was, or wish that we added, was an acronym list. Thank, yes, yeah. thank you. Thank you. It was helpful. In healthcare, I didn't know what an NFLR was either. So, <laughs> uh, and then also both VSAC and AHAC had other recommendations. And at first I wasn't sure whether to include them because it was sort of outside the scope. But then I said, well, you know what? It's, I think it were worthy of still, in, so I have a, a third of an appendix B, which is like suggested edits, another technical correction because they are the ones in the field. And so even though it wasn't within the specific scope, they have plenty of input about ways to make the programs better. So I included them as an appendix so that it would be kept. Technical. I'm telling you, I got them. We've, we've been building this together for 16 years. <laughs> Good team. All right, so here is the report. Um, and you can see it starts with the language that, um, that directed the work to be done. This was done in last year's Appropriations Act. Did our offices in collaboration with Agency of Human Services and certain departments within it. Uh, the Vermont Student Assistance Corporation, what we've been calling BSAC, and the Office of Primary Care and Area Health Education Centers Program at the University of Vermont Learner College of Medicine, which we've been calling AHEC. Uh, I think you're going to be hearing from some of them. Um, the report was actually due to the appropriations committees, but obviously of particular interest to your committees. And as Noel mentioned, it was to include this inventory of existing state programs dealing with healthcare workforce incentives. Um, a summary of the amounts and sources of the funds for each program, um, and Nola mentioned the June 30th, 2023 date. That is the, was the close of fiscal year 2023, so that's why that date was used for the directions. And then recommendations for streamlining or restructuring programs, um, and those are the recommendations from BSAC and AHEC. Um, then we got to the inventory, and Nolan talked some about how he put that together. We tried to give you the, uh, the name of the program, the statute, if it was codified, uh, which department in state government it is using, and who, uh, who is the outside administrator or grantee, the amount appropriated either now or on an ongoing basis, the source of the funds, whether the funds are base, base funds, so built into the funding on an annual, into the budget on an annual basis or one time, just funding appropriated um, one time and it have to be reappropriated for the funding to continue. And then the carry forward, if any of unobligated balances as of that date. So we have many programs. You can talk through them if you want, but um, 
Some of them are were only in session law. Several of them were in Act 183 of 2022, which was a workforce development bill and I think other topics um, from the Commerce Committee. So some of those will look particularly familiar to those of you on commerce. And some were codified, put into statute uh, on an ongoing basis, but the funding isn't necessarily um, built into the budget and less specified. Anything else you want to add on there? And then you'll see the recommendations from the collaborators. Um, so I think we'll be speaking to in their testimony as well as the acronym list Nolan mentioned and the suggested edits and technical corrections. Another thing I would add um, or end with my end is a, a thank you to um, Sarah Clark, who uh, before she left did uh, a bunch of the heavy lifting on the inventory um, to AHS for the timeliness of their information because they had to, you know, Rich Donahue and his crew had to go to multiple agencies to get information. Thank you to Liz Cody from AHAC for multiple corrections and terminologies of things, mm -hmm. always keeping me straight on the subject. And then to Tom Little and his crew at VSAC, again, for their timeliness and the responsiveness of, of getting me the information. Definitely agree back. I have, I have not a question, but a potential request. Sorry, no one. Is there any way to structure the spreadsheet by the administrator or grantee? So we have like all AHAC together, all SAC together, all AHS, or that would be a pain. I forget why it is ordered the way it was. There was a reason. There was a very good reason. Oh, I see what it was. It was by year. It was by year in the past. Yeah, yeah statutory. <clears throat> but, I did it that way. but I can restructure it. That'd be great. I mean, if you can keep both, some people might like it this way, but I would love to see if I grouping. Thank you. When you have time. In the summer. Okay. No, I'm, I'm kidding. kidding. <laughs> if I remember right, two years ago in a budget, we appropriated dollars and expecting it to be a two year period, I think. So that we appropriated in in the 2022 20, 20, budget, that we expected those funds to be expended within a two in a two year period. So we didn't we didn't put more dollars into them last year. Right. Well, I think you'll see uh, from some of the recommendations, there are recommendations regarding carry forward that would, to, I think, make that more systematized in the programs we're creating. Sure. Okay. Okay. Thank you both. Liz? Hi, I'm Liz Cody, and I am from the University of Vermont, and I represent the AHEC program. And um, thank you for inviting me. I'm mostly here to be a resource and to answer your questions, but in hearing some of this conversation, there are so many things like now I want to respond to. <laughs> um, I have been involved with educational loan repayment for 19 years with the AHEC program. AHEC has administered educational loan repayment for 27 years. Um, the first visceral response that I have is to the data question, saying that there are no data or there's a lack of data. I want to say there are a ton of data for these programs. I can tell you almost anything about every applicant, age, race, ethnicity, gender identity, where they went to high school, where they, they went to health profession student, um, school, what their average debt is, where they work, how many hours a week they work, all kinds of things. And then the attributes of those workplaces. So we have a ton of data for our programs. Where we, the problem is, what does it all mean as far as impact, program impact? Are people 
staying in their jobs because of these programs? That's something we can't really answer. It's a really complex question because so many different things factor employment decisions. Um, but we do have a system for collecting data, storing it, um, and analyzing it. I also have to respond to um, a lot of ideas about, well, we could do this or do that. I encourage you when new programs are initiated or new ideas, processes are added, there needs to be payment for or budgeting for administration and budgeting for program evaluation. So we're, we administer these educational loan repayment programs for um, almost three decades. And for um, 26 years of that time, we did not receive any administration funding. We had to raise administration funding from different sources. Every dollar we received for these programs were allocated as awards. So we have to think about those things because none of this can be administered. It's, it's not free. It's really labor intensive, in fact. And, and um, evaluation is labor intensive. Um, so please, as you move forward, think about administrative cost and, and budget for it. There are also um, you know, ideas of, uh, about, um, it'd be nice to talk with everybody who had one of these awards. You know, that again, we have to think about the, the administrative burden of that and, and uh, is, it, is it practical? AHEC um, spends a lot of time counseling applicants and recipients of the educational loan repayment program. Um, and a lot of time that counseling is, can you really commit to this obligation, this time period? Does this fit with what your career goals are? And we work with folks to ensure that they know what they're signing and agreeing to. And um, the service period is really a, a something that is talked about a lot because the longer the period is, the, the more they have to be sure they can stay put in that certain work site for a two year or longer period. We have experimented with multi-year contracts. So we, we have one-year programs, two-year programs. Back in 2015, 2014, 15, 16, all of our programs are at least two years in length. Um, and we learn a lot. With all of those decisions, there are consequences. Some we can anticipate and others are surprises. And then we, we adjust from there. With the nursing programs, we learned that multi-year contracts were more problematic than the benefit. Nurses do move around within the state a lot. Um, and we were spending so much time trying to counsel nurses to stay in the same work site for two years. Um, and a lot of them wanted to break contracts. So then we were forced either there was a breach of contract or a repayment, or sometimes they qualified for a job, a transfer. Um, what is the, is there a question? Liz, why, why would a nurse that signs a contract that basically work in within the state, why is that a problem if they leave their, say their employment in Northeast Kingdom and work in Burlington? When they receive a contract, it's for a specific work site within the state because they're trying to stabilize the, the workforce within each organization. And so somebody signs a contract is to stay put for 12, 24 months in a certain work site so that that work site can, can know that they have locked in service. Um, and otherwise, we're always going to see, we're going to see that migration from some of the counties into Burlington, into Chittenden County. And so we're trying to like stabilize the work sites around the state. Um, and so it, it's not a free for all as far as transferring to any site within the state. Longitudinally, we do look at retention um, after the program. And for that kind of thing, we do look at, are they still working in Vermont someplace? So we don't stick with the same work site. But for the duration of a contract, it is for a specific work site. Do, do, do we have buy-in from the single hospital to where the contract is signed? Does that hospital also provide some, some incentive to keep those nurses there? Yes, so that is another piece of the educational loan repayment program that isn't really talked about in these reports. We work directly with all of the employers. They are co-signers of the service obligation with the recipient. So it's coordinated with them. 
the, not only is the recipient buying into, yes, I'm signing on the dotted line, so is the employer. Um, and so then we're receiving input from both of them as far as are they delivering that service obligation? Are they still there when funds are dispersed? So it's all very coordinated. Um, and some work sites contribute matching funds to the, the award from the state. And then we take those in and bundle it into one award um, and one service obligation. Um, so there's a lot of coordination that goes on. Um, I, I think that the reports are very high level. And so there are a lot of details that we weren't able to go into, but we did provide five years worth of data as the auditor's office requested um, for the nursing programs. And we showed for our loan repayment programs, which are focused on retention, um, the, a significant majority of those nurses are still here working in Vermont. And so we provided individual level data about those nurses and the ones who left wh where they went, Virginia, Tennessee, Massachusetts. For some of them, we know more information about why they left. Um, for others, we don't necessarily, but we do try to collect that. Um, and for the majority who, the handful who have left, we do know where they are. Um, a lot of these programs are focused on financial incentives and in working with individuals, we hear a lot of reasons why they may want to leave Vermont or leave their work site within the state. And many times it's not a financial reason. Um, it has to do with the work site. Sometimes it's about career opportunity and um, compensation improvement, but other times it's about different things. It's family needs, it's um, due to divorce or sick parents taking care of people. It's about workplace environment and not being able to get through the day at a certain work site. We hear a lot of those gory stories. So there, it's, it's very complex what, um, you know, what uh, guides people to make their, the decisions. Um, I've, the educational loan repayment program is for licensed ready to work people, individuals, professionals, they're not trainees anymore. Uh, there's an immediate return on the investment because they're locked in for service right away and we can track it. The longitudinal tracking of all of these programs is labor intensive. You have to keep track. Where are they? What are they doing? Where are they working? It takes a, it takes a lot um, to know. Um, but I, I just, I, <clears throat> AHS and the health department <laughs> oversees our program. We do have process measures in our grant. We do have performance measures. The question is, are they the right ones? And how can we look at all of these programs globally and compare them as far as which are more effective, where should, which ones should be invested in more, which ones don't appear as effective, or aren't working as intended, how can we adjust? So I think that these reports all bring us to really good conversations. Um, and when I read them, when I've read them, I you know, try to like think, don't be defensive. <laughs> But, it, but they are sometimes just too surface level to get to the details. And um, we have a lot of experience and uh, a lot of data to inform these programs. And we do adjust. Um, one of the, the things that's important in legislation is being clear on the intentions of the legislation or the program, but also allowing some flexibility for some experimentation and adjusting. You know, we tried, we tried multi years that didn't seem to work. So we go, we went back to one year. Should we try multi years again? That's what we're doing right now. We're experimenting where the environment changes. And so we need a little bit of a wiggle room to, to, um, to respond to those changes. And um, priorities in legislation are good um, because priorities help us identify, for instance, certain medical specialties or type of care sites that are priority but it doesn't eliminate the others that are important that could come to the forefront. So that also gives us something to work with. Um, so there are certain nuances that, that really make a difference in how a program can be administered and then its overall effectiveness. What questions do you have for me? Yes, thank you very much for your report. So I just want to be clear here. You have actual data, numbers of students who, who receive scholarships who stayed in Vermont as per Act 183 and 
2022, which I know we took a lot of data, a lot of information on when we were in healthcare when we were putting some of this together. Do you have that data? No, because that's not the program we administer. We administer educational loan repayment. Right. But, so uh, only loan repayment. So it's for people who are licensed already. They've already been trained. They're not scholarships. They're already trained and they're able to work. We have that kind of data for those people. But as far as ones who receive scholarships in their own pipeline, that. no. Okay. Um, with the exception of one new program that we work um, in collaboration with BSAC on, and that is the um, Medical Student Incentive Scholarship Loan, loan okay. Forgiveness Program. Okay. Um, and so because we collaborate on that, we do have internally that data and tracking and, and, and sharing data back and forth with BSAC. Mm -hmm. um, but that's the only program where, okay. where it's students and scholarship related or loan forgiveness related where we have da data. And most of the other scholarship related things are belong to BSAC and you don't have. Right. We focus on educational loan repayment. Okay. Gotcha. So in the debt for, the, for those um, recipients are from programs from all over the country. Um, it's undergraduate, graduate level. It's lenders from all over the country, direct loans, private loans, that kind of thing. It's not just Vermont based because they may have trained in other places. Okay. Um, and all of the debt information that we have, everything's verified. We do try to coordinate with the state when it's possible to receive direct information. For instance, um, one of the things we look at are Medicaid, the Medicaid population served, and we receive data directly from DIVA on that because we learned over the years that self-reported data were not reliable. Um, we do ask applicants to report if they have other service obligations or scholarships that might be service obligations because sometimes they don't always know or think that scholarship they received had a service obligation attached. We try to pull that out, but they don't always report it. And that's when we go to, back to, if it's a state program, the health department and try to receive that information. The health department works with us on coordinating federal programs, the National Health Service Scholar Scholars um, National Health Service Corps, they receive data on that and share that with us so that we can do the crosswalk and make sure there are no double dippers or concurrent service obligations. So it's not that we're paying for one, one uh, award, uh, two awards, but one set of time, one time frame. We, we want to avoid that. We want to leverage these dollars. So there is coordination. There just could be more coordination. It could be improved. Um, the other thing I'll mention is that the, the overall environment is changing at the federal level. Educational um, loan programs are popping up all over the place, whether they're employer or federal, for all kinds of things. We need to be aware of that. We need to understand what they are so that we're leveraging those and that we're not using state dollars and federal dollars can be leveraged. Um, public service loan forgiveness, that program got off to a bump, bumpy start, but it is actually happening. We're, we, we need to be aware of that. And how does that impact our programs? Um, we need to stay on top of loan cancellation programs that we're hearing about at the federal level and how that can influence. We know there was a pause on federal pay, required payments during COVID, three-year pause when uh, federal direct loan recipients did not have to make payments. How does that affect um, loan debt as the pinch point for these folks? Um, are there other things that we could be doing? But I have a ton of data um, and we provide that to the health department as well. And I'm happy to talk with you anytime about the data questions and how we um, try to understand what it all means. Thanks. I um, thanks for coming in. I, I want to find out if I heard you right. Did, did you say that uh, in terms of administrative monies that you don't get any? So we do starting 2023. So for 26 years, 27 years, we did not. We had to raise those dollars from our sources. And the way we raised those dollars were from private foundations, as well as contributions from the hospitals from around the state. So we raised those dollars separately. We do, in the last uh, 
15 years receive other grant funds from the state separate from those loan repayment dollars, but those other grant funds have completely different deliverables attached to them. So it's not like those dollars allowed for the administration of this program. Starting with 2023, it's the first time we were allowed administrative funds for this program. We pulled off something amazing, <laughs> but it's not a good business plan <laughs> and it's not sustainable. Can I just, I want to, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, please. Um, I just want to verify a couple of things on the actual programs based on this chart. So it looks like you have the loan repayment for healthcare providers and healthcare educa educational loan repayment fund for an amount of $667,111. That amount is available for two years. And so the first year has been, so, so I'm curious if we've gone through the two years and there's zero dollars or there's still one year left of the 667,000. So we have a grant right now that is a two year grant. That also is a new innovation of two year grants before they were one year at a time. Um, we have a two year grant and for each of those two years, we have 667,000. That grant ends December 2024, so it ends at the end of this year. Okay. Um, so the grant has money for FY25, which the process is the 24 process. How that's appropriated, I can't say. Okay. So right now you have nothing available. You're waiting for that appropriation for the next, as of July 1st. Right, oh, okay. but technically we have a grant that says- That says, okay. So we can, okay, gotcha. And then there's one that you do with, BSAC, which you talked about, which is the scholarships for 10, third, and fourth year UVM medical students. The program repeals on July 1st, 2027, it was at one point, close to 1.5 million. It says there's zero carry forward. So has that money all gone out or is there still money available for? I'm gonna defer that to BSAC. Okay, that's fine. And then the other one I see is the Vermont Healthcare Professional Loan Repayment Program for 2 million and then another 500,000. It looks like it was ARPA one-time money. So is there any, has that gone out the door? Is there any money left available? So we have a grant for that and that ends December, 2024. And the majority of those funds have gone out the door or are encumbered for year two awards. Okay. I believe that we have about $50,000 in that program that is not either dispersed or encumbered. Okay. And then it looks like the nurse faculty loan repayment program for 500,000 was one time money. And is that out the door and done? No, that also ends at the end of the year, the okay. year 2024 and 175,000 has dispersed. Okay. But there may be year two awards that are encumbered. Okay. Great. And we might, have you back into healthcare to walk through some of the data that you talked mm -hmm. about. And I want to say you've always been very helpful in coming up with data. So we appreciate that. Yeah, I would agree. I think it would be nice to know how those programs work. Did, did, did they work the way we intended okay. by getting more uh, nurse faculty available so that we could train more nurses quickly or quicker than we do now? Um, so I think it'd be interesting so that we can make recommendations to appropriations of whether or not we need to continue to fund these programs. Um, that one question I had um, going back to the contracts. Um, so nurses that, that break their contract, um, how many, about how many of those, how many times does that occur? It occurs less frequently than it used to, partly because we have such rigorous counseling that goes on and the one-year contracts. Um, you know, we, it's not good for anybody if somebody is breach of contract. It's not good for the employer, the individual, it's not good for our programs. It's a lot of work. The counseling is a lot of work. Um, but we try to um, work through some of the issues with the individuals and with their human resource department. Sometimes it's three, three of us on a Zoom trying to sort out, like, how can we make this work for everybody? Um, and so it's, for nursing of the five-year period that we just reported to the auditors, I think there was one breach of contract. Okay, so that's not, it's not prevalent. No, it's, it's not. 
Good. But it doesn't happen on its own. Right. It takes yeah. But I'm, I'm wondering. The work. Yeah. I'm wondering if there's um, maybe something to think about. Um, you know, people that are breaking their contract make more money somewhere else. Okay, I get that. But if there are other issues that that are happening in someone's life, as you described, how and if through your counseling they can't make it work, why why wouldn't we, as long as they're staying in Vermont, allow them to continue to receive um, that loan repayment? So in some cases we do. Okay, so you have you have that. So there is that, but that is the. The, the aim is to lock in at a certain work site. So we don't quickly go there because then it defeats the whole, it doesn't, we're not doing what we're saying we're trying to do. Yep. But if there are extenuating circumstances, the entire contract talks about extenuating okay. circumstances. I just want to make sure that there was the ability for you to work with, with yes, the, there is. the person and if need be, then, then switch it. As long as they stay in Vermont, it's not moving to state. And there are also clauses in the contract for leaves of absence where they take a pause, and then when they come back, the contract end date is extended to make up for that time. So there's it's it's pretty sophisticated. Yep. That sounds like you've thought a lot about this. I think we have Jonathan Leslie and Art, or no Art, Jonathan. Thank you. Uh, if I might um, expand on Representative McVaughn's line of questioning with regards to the indirect, the lack of administrative funding, was no de minimis offered or preferred to your organization or did you solicit uh, an allowance for indirect funds of five, 10% or whatever and were denied? And if you were denied, was there a rationale provided? Uh, we were denied for many years, but but we did solicit and over time, we, we got that last year. <laughs> okay. Uh, but in initially, you said there was no funding for administrative. Correct. the The grants that we would receive would would be very specific. That the dollars had to be used one hundred percent for awards. I see. Thank you. Leslie, did you still have a question? Yeah, um, it's more for you. I think both of you. There were like eight recommendations that came through AHEC, and just wondering if there's going to be opportunity to discuss them and what the process might be about. So this is a first look at the report, and then we'll, yeah. as with most joint meetings that we've been having, then the chairs will get together and decide next steps. That's Thank great. you. Yeah. But if you have specific questions on the recommendations, feel free to. Well, it seemed like a lot of consolidation and, and you know, things around that, which always makes sense to me. So I was just looking forward to a conversation on how to make it more efficient and effective. Definitely. And I want to follow up on that. Is this JFO report, and probably no one or Jen could chime in with it, is this all the scholarship incentive work that we did in the last years? Is it all here? Yeah. It is. So there's no other agency that that has other, it seems like we were bouncing around to a lot of places when we put it together. And I just want to make sure this is all of it. Related to health care. Right. Correct. Nursing yeah. and and medical and, and any of that. In terms of state. Correct. Liz will talk about there's lots of federal stuff as well. Right. This, yeah, but this is state. this is what we, we handled in the many sessions. And that's through AHS. That's okay. Right. Thank you. Other questions? Liz, thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, welcome. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Uh, thank you for having me. It's kind of delightful to kind of kick off the session, seeing so many, you know, kind of familiar faces after kind of a little bit of a layoff. So it's, this is great. And I think like Liz, I, you know, my focus predominantly was going to be to be a resource to respond to questions. The one footnote that I wanted to kind of put to the last question about state funding um, this is more on the scholarship side, but sorry, during. Can I stop you and just you need to introduce yourself. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> you think I know that? You would think. Come on. <laughs> I'm Scott Giles, uh, President and CEO of the Vermont Student Assistance Corporation, and I'm delighted to be here to respond to questions. 
Um, all, all I was going to offer there was that during the pandemic, um, and not necessarily specific, that's structured in the same way um, that the conversations our two organizations engaged with you all in the past. Um, there was scholarship funding awarded to the state colleges in particular, um, oftentimes labeled as critical occupations, but there was a significant amount of money that went to nursing um, in particular uh, during that period of time. And I mentioned that in part only because that created coordination uh, work that we engaged in with them while those resources were, were available. So I'll offer that as an asterisk because um, that money probably felt a little bit fungible um, given the way that it was appropriated and, and it probably fell outside the scope. Um, you know, kind of kind of drawing on some of what, you know, I think Liz, Liz shared, uh, our role in this predominantly has been on the scholarship side, really, except for one program that we partner with on. And so uh, where the AHEC programs, I think, as you've articulated them, are, you know, focused on kind of recruitment and retention. Uh, the programs that you asked us to run uh, certainly contributed in some ways to that, but we're, I think of them predominantly as pipeline programs where what we are trying to do is to encourage people who might not otherwise have uh, considered uh, careers in healthcare. And as, a, as the auditor said, these careers in healthcare are some of the best paying high demand jobs within our community. And there are equity issues embedded in making a decision to support scholarships because it allows us to work with low income students of kind of all ages who, you know, would succeed in these in these professions, would consider them, but are afraid of the expense associated with them because this training is within an educational context, the most expensive training, you know, by and large that um, our institutions, you know, offer. Um, and, you know, I'll just make a couple of observations. I'm going to talk briefly just about our nursing program because it's one that we have partnered with you. It grew pretty substantially over the course of the last several years. Um, and uh, it always takes, I think, as you know, my is Marilyn Cargill when she came in to kind of share information. And Marilyn retired sadly for for me and for everyone. Um, you know, those programs normally take a couple of years to really get their feet on the ground, and people have to believe they're going to be there over time for the populations that we support to really fully kind of embrace them. Um, this past year, we ran out of money with that program within about thirty days of when the application deadline was in place. Can you, just because I want to make sure we're all understanding the terminology, so which one are you, are you reverse the Vermont Nursing Forgivable Loan Incentive Program? That's correct. The one point, or the three million? Three million. Okay, thank you. Yes, so we successfully funded 289 um, applicants. Um, unfortunately, there were 70 who we were unable to fund because we did not have the resources, and that probably understates the demand uh, that was in place because once you put a cutoff and send word out that... Uh, there, that there's no more funding, you kind of turn that, that pipeline off. And partly what that reflects is the kind of broad Vermont community understanding of the availability of this program. And for particular, you know, working adults, um, you know, who were kind of previously, you know, aid eligible, but who want a career change, the idea that we can offer pretty close to a tu full tuition scholarship in exchange for a year commitment to work, uh, particularly at the Vermont State University, is a pretty powerful you know, pretty powerful incentive. Um, observations, I think Liz shared, you know, we have a fair amount of data. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, we pride ourselves in trying to share that, you know, with the committee. Uh, and would be happy to, you know, work with you over time if there are other things that you're interested in knowing. But uh, from an efficiency perspective, the other programs that we are administering for you are largely modeled after the nursing program, which allowed us to gain some administrative you know, simplicity by eliminating complexity. There are some minor differences in there. It was in part our response working with you to the conversation about consolidation. Uh, with the nursing program at this point, 87% uh, of the recipients have fulfilled their obligation through work in Vermont. So it's, you know, continues to prove to be extraordinarily successful over time from that pipeline perspective. I will say that we have been exploring uh, uh, Chair Marcotte is familiar. Several years ago, the committee came to us at one point asking for some additional data about the advancement grant, which is our non-degree grant, which also contributes in this space. Uh, and we went back and did a survey of recipients longer term to start to take a look at some more specific uh, 
um, beneficiary specific data on long term outcomes and impact on wages and you know other factors. And we've been contemplating ourselves um, whether perhaps not this year, but next year once the expanded program is more mature and we've got more of the more of these newer beneficiaries actually in the workforce, whether or not that would be a good time for us to work with you all to design something that would give us more longitudinal um, longitudinal data. Um, so, you know, I, I will pause there. I can, I know one question, um, I think uh, Liz kindly, you know, deferred to us on uh, on that. And I panicked for a moment. To, Is that the one I didn't bring? <laughs> but I did. So if you remember, I think we have $20,000 a year that we can obligate for that particular program, given the number of years that the program is in place. And we have awarded jointly together enough to, there's no more money left to award for this year. For this year, but you have it set for the remaining for the, for the years. Okay, that's years. Great. So it's in stages. So can I just... Go, can I just go through my list like we did before? So sorry. Well, let me get my list. Okay. So, um, and then I think I know there's questions. So there's one for 500,000, the nurse faculty forgivable loan program that looks like as of June 30th, there was nothing spent yet. Yeah, so we've got uh, about 28 applications in now um, in, that we are kind of evaluating at this point. So okay. our expectation is that we'll start to see disbursements taking place from there. Great. And then the 1.5 million for the mental health professional. Uh, at this point, we've actually obligated 1.1 million. This is one that, that what we experience with the new programs is there's a slow start, and then it starts to roll. Uh, particularly as the educational institutions really come to understand the availability of the funding. And now that our inst you know, what we are now seeing is just each of the Vermont institutions that are providing graduate level training in mental health counseling are now integrating this into their counseling right. programs. So. so do we know how many people in that, is that 1.1 million? Uh, I will ha give me a minute and I will be able to answer that question because I do have the number of awards. And uh, at this point we received 130 applications and we've awarded 90 of them. 90, okay. great. Mm. Yes. Just on this one, sure. um, just a little anecdotal. Um, we had conversations with Northeast Kingdom Human Services a few months ago. They're opening, they're planning on opening yeah. up that new uh, house. Uh, front porch. Front porch, yeah. And, um, you know, I, I, I asked the question of whether or not they had sufficient staff to be able to open that up. And they said because of the work that we did Great. here, that they have um, filled all of their vacancies and they're not worried about being able to bring more people on. So oh, this it. is working. That's great. I'm thinking rural Vermont. Yeah, yeah in yeah. rural Vermont especially. Yep. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Um, so then there's the Vermont Psychiatric Mental Health Nurse Practitioner Program with a million dollars. And yes, and, and that one was just launched in December. That was the one launched in December. Yep. Okay. Great. So we are going through that same process and expect we'll have the same, and the same uh, with uh, dental hygiene too. Okay. As opposed to December launch. Great, thank you. So, yep. And then Mari. Oh, oh. Go ahead, Mari. I was just tagging off of. I was going to ask the same questions Representative Houghton did about those specific loans. The uh, six, seven, eight nurse faculty, nurse faculty, mental health professionals, and the psychiatric mental health nurse practitioner. You spoke about kind of generally about what caused a delay? Um, are oh. there more specific administrative or bureaucratic issues that might be helpful for us to be aware of in, in each of those four cases? Yeah, and so I want to be, I want to be cautious because we have a great working relationship with AHS, but for new programs, their procurement process does not align with the academic kind of calendar. The calendar. So when we have a new program, um, and in this particular case, funds were not made available until, you know, effectively July 1st of this year. They delayed their willingness to engage in the MOU conversation on these new programs until some of their other priorities were kind of, you know, worked through. 
So we weren't able to get the MOUs in place with them, even though we've got models for doing this um, until in the fall. Yeah. And the December launch for those two programs simply reflects when we got their funds. And then the facilities, educational entities and facilities that would um, offer, like UVM Medical Center, that would offer scholarships or programs like this have their own calendar. Right. In, in, in an ideal world, if I can you know, step back from our perspective, and because of the nur nursing is a great example of this because the program has been around for a while and there's a lot of support. We have more comfort marketing, even though we know that we're not, you know, we won't know what the dollars are until the end. But if we are looking at new students, you know, just the student calendar, they're making financial aid, you know, related decisions in kind of May, yeah. you know, the spring. Now we navigate that, our budget cycle, you know, doesn't support that, but where you've got a base program or where we've got carry forward authority, we know we have the money. We can, you know, go ahead and navigate that effectively. With these new programs, what we run into is students will have already made their decisions and already done their financing for the fall by the time we are stepping into the, uh, by the time we have the MOU in place. And you'll, you know, you'll see that we have made a recommendation, you know, within the language that we entered. We, AHS is not the only place where we've experienced this before. Um, in some cases, we solved it with multi-year MOUs that, you know, that worked our way through it. In other cases, we worked with the legislature to appropriate the money directly to us so that we didn't have to go through the MOU process in order to, to be able to release it. Because these are global commitment dollars, I think that there are some other strings around, but the, the relationship is good, but there's a process that they go through that. I think that's really helpful and good for us to be aware of. Thank you. Yeah. My question was about the dates also and why it takes um, a, a significant amount long, a significant amount of time to get these up and running. When we, I, I know from myself, I'm sure others that we always we feel like this is such a a need that we're worried that. And but the dates, I see, can see now where you're saying the dates are so closely aligned from when the money's appropriated or the bills are passed and in effect, and we're all looking for the start of the calendar year or the or a start of a cycle for for nurses to apply to, to apply to these scholarships to get into school. So we're a little bit off, we're off. Yeah. I do think that once we have these programs up and running and there's a cons consistent funding, like with nursing, we tell everybody the application deadline was February. We, so we take all those applications and we can actually share with you what we're seeing. If there's money related issues emerging at that point, we still won't make an absolute commitment until the budget is far enough along, you know, that we see it, but that becomes the ideal world. Now, what I will say, these programs have allowed us to do something that we've, because um, we had three of them that were two, two with your committee and one other new program we were launching, um, that uh, allows us to leverage our existing partnerships with the colleges and universities. So candidly, with these new programs that are coming now, I've already had a conversation with all of our school presidents directly and said, I've got money here, you've got students, um, some of whom you're at risk of not retaining, others of whom are starting in the spring. I shouldn't have a penny left at the end of the spring. If you've any of your students that are interested in working in Vermont, you know, afterwards. And so that's where, why we're seeing like with the mental health counseling, once you get, and you know, Liz would confirm this, move from the president to the individual, the dean who's running that program and or better yet, the graduate counselor who is supporting that student. Well, now they've got all that material in front of them and you know they're meeting with all of their individual students and you know, kind of putting this, you know, putting the availability of this um, in front of them. So I think but we share your sense of urgency. I will yeah. say it's a, we do everything within our power to make it as easy as possible for our partners to reach the right conclusion as quickly as possible. Good. Topping. Um, on these loans, is there, um, when the loan is set up, is there a, a rate of interest that's attached to them? Yeah, so for most of these, these are zero interest loans, um, you know, which is something that is a design choice 
that we all that we've all made. So um, I think when we say most, we there are some other contexts in which there are um, election related costs that can be added. So at the point which one of these converts to a loan, there's costs associated with actually recollecting on the loan. And in most of the cases now, I think we have the authority to be able to add reasonable collection costs kind of to that loan in lieu of an interest rate. Just out of curiosity, what is the rate of interest on those loans that have a rate of interest? Um, it's probably under 3% when you take much, probably under 3% when you look at collection costs. That's interesting. I, I, I mean, I got to say this. I get a lot of people that call me about the rate of interest that they have to pay for VSAC when they go through VSAC. Mm -hmm. It isn't 3% that they're telling me. Yeah, well, those are different loan products. Yeah, I know they are. You kind of different, different loan product, and those rates are structured re related to both their risk and the payment terms that they have selected. So our lowest rate is probably about 4.4%. Edie? Thank you. Um, I just wanted to go back to that question about um, how do we work with your organization and the administration um, a little bit more seamlessly, a little bit quicker. Right now we're looking at a nursing shortage. But in five years, we could be looking at a different shortage in a different department. And I would love to have any learnings that you come up with that allow us to get money out faster. I understand if the program's in place, of course, that's going to be easier. All of those pieces are set up. But as you're instituting these programs, it would be incredibly beneficial for us so that we can put better language in new legislation. Yeah, thank you. I think, I mean, I think from our pers our experience, there have been two ways we've handled it. You know, one is to get um, our partner agency comfortable with a multi-year, you know, kind of MOU. And usually we end up getting it. Um, the other way is to appropriate the money directly to us, which is also, as a instrumentality of the state, something that is is done with the vast majority of our programs. I think the complication in this context is the source of funding, um, but that doesn't mean it's not insuperable. And we've been engaged in conversations with our partners at AHS about how much latitude they might have. Because nursing is a great example. There's actually a mix of global commitment and general fund dollars in there. Question for Scott. I got one more. If a person is in, um, let's say, the a medical technician um, education loan program, if if that person um, goes into the field, <laughs> well, I, I guess what I'm trying to find out is if they were not in, if, if they not, weren't approved in the beginning. But they, they so they went to school and they paid. They had a loan, maybe through VSAC. Now, if they're working and they apply, can they get their loan forgiven? So I think this is going to be the division between the two programs. So not through our program because ours is effectively the forgivable loan program is a scholarship with a work requirement, and so those commitments are made right at the time that you apply. But I think the AHEC program, which is a loan repayment program, would be the program that, that would then be the one that would we would encourage them to apply to. So they can. So, so that particular group is a new, um, newly established educational loan repayment program that we are standing up. Um, so not quite yet, but soon. Um, the answer is yes, but that applies. I'm, I'm thinking about this conversation globally to any any profession. If they if they already have educational debt existing, we're looking to repay it. That's when AHEC comes in, versus when they're a student. That's VSAC. Um, okay. So med med tax is the newest, the latest new program based on last year's legislation. 
and we're working to reach those individuals. They're not licensed or registered by the state. Um, so it's been challenging to stand up this program. It's a little bit unlike our other programs. They're not licensed by the state? No, we're registered. And they don't have to, to have a college degree. Can I make one other observation? I don't mean to kind of cut anyone off. One of the, uh, what I did just want to share is that there is some work that we are doing um, in two areas, nursing and respiratory therapy that is outside the context of the state funded programs. Uh, although not unrelated to it, that I thought I would share in part because it does, I think, implicate one of the concerns that the auditor had raised in his uh, kind of report about the relation, you know, what is the relationship between these programs and some of the hospital, you know, recruitment and, you know, kind of other programs. And I won't be able to speak to, you know, some of the other state NARPA money that the, the institutions got. Um, but you may be familiar, the uh, Vermont Business Roundtable got an earmark, um, you know, through Senator Leahy for uh, Vermont Talent Pipeline work. Um, we are actually a core part of that uh, activity, and we're providing two sets of services. But going to the coordination question, um, and I should stop, if you're not familiar with this program, it's an employer-based program. We've got some seed money for pilot purposes, but effectively employers are, the hospitals are identifying employees um, that they currently have who they think um, could or and would be interested in successfully upskilling in order to fill positions that um, they are not currently qualified to fill. Nursing, respiratory therapy being two good examples of that. The way they're structuring is they're prepared to put up their own money in the form of a loan, similar structure to what we are doing with the Vermont um, the Nursing Forgivable Loan Program. Um, VSAC is administering that program, but there are two pieces to it that um, we're providing. One is the career and education counseling. So we've got counselors working with them. The second part of our role is really to weave together all of the various financial aid opportunities that are available so that at least on the front end, not on the back end, we know there's not duplication. Those that are qualify should take advantage of the state program. Um, those that don't qualify for the state program may take advantage purely of the, the full employer-based um, piece. Um, uh, but that allows us to have some window into what the, the shortage needs at the hospital level are and at the you know, what their recruitment strategies are. Right now, there are about seven Vermont hospitals participating in this. Based off of the first cohort, I guess we're in our second UVM cohort, uh, we've got four others that are asking now whether you know they can participate. Um, and that's a great example of our trying to weave together both the public investment that you're making um, with the private investment that the hospitals know they need to make um, is a way of addressing some of the broader concerns that the uh, state auditor identified. Yeah, and I appreciate that because I think we have to remember it can't just be us and it can't just be them. The crisis is too deep for our workforce challenges. And so working together and having partners like both of you who can bridge it together is, is really helpful and impactful. So thank you for bringing that up. Thank you. Yeah, the questions for Scott. <clears throat> Scott, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity and um, appreciate the chance to talk about the programs and support the work you're doing. And I'll close by saying thank you for the support that you guys have given us through the years. It's exciting to be able to share some of the outcomes because it's making a real difference. And, um, and we talk about it at the aggregate level, but at the student level, this is transforming the lives of students who thought they had limited futures. So thank you. So would it be appropriate to ask if they might write their testimony for, I don't think there's anything on our website so what they testified to. So I think the testimony is the report for now. And then I think we'll discuss <laughs> next steps are. Okay, it seemed to go beyond, I mean, it was more human than a grid. That's yeah. a, that, that it was the humanity that was mm -hmm. nice. Thing. Thanks for taking various vaccination clinics too. Exactly. We try and be everywhere. We're gonna we're gonna try and capture everybody.
Uh, thank you. And Liz, thank you, both of you, you, for programs that you run and how you help honors. We really appreciate it. Wendy, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, I apologize, I'm on the Amtrak, so I'm hoping um, <laughs> I can be clear for you. Can Thanks. you hear me okay? Yes, yes. we can. Thank you. Um, I think, you know, I, I know you're, you're only, you're here to answer some questions, or if you can't, you're going to take the questions down, get back to us. So I appreciate that. Um, so I guess um, one question that I have is the preceptor program and, um, you know, has that been launched yet? Um, if it isn't, when will it be? Um, that type of thing. Okay, I could partially hear you. Um, should I state my name for the record? Sure, that'd be great. Great. Um, my name is Wendy Trafton. Um, I am the Deputy Director of Healthcare Reform at the Agency of Human Services. Um, and I know the programs we're talking about today, some are through Agency of Human Services Central Office, and some are through the Vermont Department of Health. Uh, be able to speak to this. I apologize yeah. that I'm asking you to repeat your question. I could not hear it. I think I think we're both on on the receiving ends of of uh, audio issues. I think I, I think probably the best thing for us to do is we'll get questions down from from our committees and we'll get them to you and then um, we can have a conversation. Um, you know, in the next few weeks as we start looking at the budget and uh, talking talking to you about those questions. Thank you. I'd look forward to that. Great. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening in with us this afternoon. We appreciate that. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye-bye. So any more questions, committees? I look forward to that conversation. I do have concerns about, you know, we're talking about the real life impact, life changing impact it has had. I know personally people who could have benefited from the pipeline program. Uh, so I do have some of the concerns we've already discussed about why it's taken so long. Um, yes, it's fully applicated apparently now, but it's taken a long time, so. I agree. Okay, well. Okay. Madam Chair, it's been oh, great. Sorry, oh, Brian, Brian. Brian. Hi, I have um, just a quick comment. Like in hearing this, it's great to hear that, you know, uh, all the hard work going on around recruitment through um, these incentives. And it's just, can you hear me okay? Yes. 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 Okay. Sorry. Um, but I think something that I think we need to reflect on more, and I'm not sure who we need to hear from um, to make these decisions is, how do we make the working conditions for our healthcare workers better? Because as a healthcare worker, I can say that like it's getting increasingly harder with the acuity and it feels really like extractive. It's like an extractive system for our labor and our energy. Um, so, I, you know, that's just a question is, are there other things we could be doing to make it more of a regenerative system for the workforce? Thank you, Brian. That's a good point. We will. We will keep talking about that in committee. Anything else? Okay. okay. Again, thank thank you, yeah. um, Madam Chair, Healthcare Committee, for joining us this afternoon. It's been great collaborating with you the last few years to make our healthcare system better. I think we're starting to see some yeah. fruits to that labor, um, and hopefully, we can we're we're able to find the dollars to continue on some of these programs that we've found to be um, working very well. So, um, but it's going to take all of us to, yeah. to be able to push things through. So um, thanks again. And yep. everybody have a good weekend.